So welcome back, everybody. And uh, we're going to conclude our conference now with the final investigation that we're really excited to have. It's called Forensic Architecture, Horizontal Verification, and the Socialized Production of Evidence. So it will be an investigation by Robert Trafford and moderated by Lauri Treffers. And uh, Laurie Treffers is a Dutch freelance journalist, and she's a conflict researcher that focuses especially on the Middle East and North Africa region. And she volunteers as a geolocation researcher for air wars, and currently she's mainly focused on the region of uh, Yemen. Uh, she holds an uh, MA in conflict studies and human rights from Utrecht University, and she wrote her MA thesis on resistance practices among women in the Palestinian village of Budrus. And this thesis was nominated for the Vision of 2018 Peace Thesis Prize and also for the 2019 Master Thesis Awards of the Utrecht University. So we're very happy to have as our moderator today, Laurie Treffer. So I'd like to welcome you on stage. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. So I work as an open data investigator and as such I know how easy it has become to challenge the narratives of government and other official institutions. Usually, you know, from behind your laptop, on the couch, in your sweatpants, with a bag of popcorn next to you. But maybe that's one of the few perks of being a freelancer, so that's definitely one of them. Um, and you know, as I have done this work now for about a year, and it's such a new and interesting and fascinating field to work in, um, but there are so many questions that we still need to answer and that we need to think about. For example, what does um, my work as an open source investigator add to truth in this age of, you know, Donald Trump, basically, fake news? What does it mean? And you know, what value can I add to that? Um, and we're only really at the beginning of answering these questions and at the forefront of you know, rethinking our notions of truth is definitely forensic architecture. Um, I'm very happy that Robert is here today with us. Uh, FA is a research agency focusing on corporate and state violence. Um, they focus on human rights abuses and also on environmental destruction. Um, and they use uh, open source, but also architectural techniques and um, technologies. Uh, so today we have Robert with us. Robert is a investigator at Forensic Architecture and he mainly focuses on um, open source data analysis um, and data mining. Um, let me get this straight. So um, Robert worked with Forensic Architecture since 2017. And before that, he worked as a freelance journalist. He published, in, among others, The Times, The Intercept, and The Independent. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few of the recent, uh, recent investigations he worked on to just get a bit of a, a light on what he, what he does. Um, one of my favorite um, investigations by forensic architecture is the one on the allegations of um, killings and torture um, on a military base in Cameroon that is used by US forces. Um, but he also, for example, looked into the killing of Kurdish human rights lawyer Tahir Elsi, in, um, who was probably, according to the analysis by FA, killed by Turkish police. And um, yeah, I'm very glad to have Robert here with us today. And he's going to explain to us why FA calls their own practices counter forensic, which I found interesting considering the name, but maybe that's just me. Um, and he's going to tell us all about that right now. Robert, the floor is yours. Hi. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, some of which I'm going to repeat. Um, okay, so I work for, um, oh no, sorry, before I start, um, 
I told myself I was going to say thank you to everyone who's been on this stage um, before me today. It's been a really interesting day. Um, yeah, it's, um, it's great to hear so many ideas bouncing around. It's great to hear about some of these incredible projects that are going on in the field. It's a really vital um, time for um, civil society investigation. I mean, that both it's a very important time and it's a very alive feeling time. There's a lot of energy and there's a lot of new projects and it's a, um, it's a great, great area to work in. Um, okay, so I work for an organization called Forensic Architecture, as we've just heard. Um, what we do is investigate human rights violations using um, a range of techniques, uh, including open source investigation, video analysis, uh, spatial and architectural practice, digital modeling, um, and we work with, um, well, with and on behalf of affected communities um, who have been affected by state and military violence. Uh, we produce evidence for legal forums, for uh, human rights groups, for activists, for investigative reporters and the media, um, as well as for um, arts and cultural institutions. And we're going to take a look um, at all of these aspects today. Um, now, forensic architecture exists because conflict, um, violence, and human rights violations have become heavily mediatized um, in the last decade or so, really, since a sort of um, explosion of Web 2.0 and the, what we might call the open source revolution, certainly since everybody had a smartphone. Um, incidents are now often documented and relayed to the world by fragments of video material, uh, chemical weapons attacks such as uh, here in Douma, Syria, in uh, April 2018, um, are a very important um, and quite lively example uh, of that. And our understanding of such events uh, is also increasingly created and communicated through digital media, uh, sometimes in ways which seem to make these incidents um, somewhat less clear rather than more clear. Um, so in a sense, uh, forensic architecture um, is in part a set of kind of technical and theoretical tools for unpacking those mediatized events, for navigating between pieces of media um, relating to these kind of contentious incidents, um, and trying to access the truth which often exists uh, behind and between the fragments of media that escape from these scenes of conflict and kind of behind the cordon of these human rights violations. Um, but forensic architecture also, as the prevalence of open source video material um, has unraveled our assumptions about truth, um, as concepts, as Laurie mentioned, like fake news and post-truth, kind of challenge us to, um, to ask how we believe what we believe anyway, uh, forensic architecture is also proposing a new model for collectively and collaboratively uh, constructing truths and um, building Oh, a little advert for the tool I used, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> uh, collaboratively constructing truth and building coalitions around uh, the exercise of that truth production. Um, so today I want to talk to you about forensic architecture's proposition for uh, truth production in a post-truth world. And I'm going to do that um, by reference to a handful of our investigations. Um, so we are facing a certain crisis presently, I think that much is clear. It could be called a crisis of epistemic or epistemological representation. Um, essentially, as I understand it, people are rejecting the idea that um, institutions that we might previously have trusted to conduct this work, uh, are, they're no longer trusting those institutions to reach out into the world, uh, to um, find information, to sort of uh, assemble facts, and to return to us with that information in ways that we can trust. Um, now, that task of creating and disseminating truth was uh, previously performed by institutions, whether in government, journal journalism, or civil society. Um, and we, as the citizenry, always existed in a kind of vertical relationship with that truth. Um, that truth was created elsewhere, um, possibly behind a wall of closed sources, uh, and handed down to us. Uh, but the internet and this open source revolution has really exploded the stability of that system. Um, and those institutions are no longer uh, providing truths around which we are willing or able to orient ourselves um, for better or worse. Um, the vertical has been supplanted by the horizontal um, and the cathedral has become the marketplace or the bazaar. Um, now as those institutions falter, um, there's a certain breed of political actor, largely on the populist right, as we're very familiar with, uh, that's gaining an increasingly sure footing. Um, and our director has previously called them the insurgents against truth. 
Um, it's a phrase I think really carries a lot of weight. Um, the heart of this insurgency against truth is the following ambition. Um, they want to encourage the public to believe that we're unmoored from truth and facts, that we're floating um, adrift in a sea of misinformation. Um, not only that there's no possibility of uh, reaching out into the world and acquiring facts that we can all agree on and orient ourselves around, but further that we shouldn't trust people or institutions that um, encourage us to believe that they can or that purport to be able to do so. And that's undermining some very, th very central um, shared um, agreements which kind of underpin democracies and underpin human rights. Um, and it's under this cover um, of equivocation and uncertainty, it's under this cover that human rights violations of the 21st century are being carried out and subsequently concealed. Um, and by way of example, I'd like to begin with a little bit of audience participation. Um, so this uh, is a tweet um, by the IDF's press office, the Israel Defense Force, um, and it was uh, published in July 2018. It related to um, an air assault on a building in Gaza City. Um, the text uh, accompanying the video is somewhat contentious, not entirely untrue, we must give them that, but uh, certainly somewhat contentious in ways we don't really need to go into just yet. But I want to show you the video um, that, they, um, that they shared online here. Uh, what you're going to see is uh, the demolition of a building. Uh, you're going to see um, four warning strikes, um, followed by um, a series of larger demolition strikes. Um, these warning strikes, you might be wondering what is a warning strike. Um, it's a, a sort of um, it's an element of military nomenclature which really says a lot about the moment that we find ourselves in. It's essentially a humanitarian warhead. Um, the idea of a warning strike is that it makes um, citizens in an area about to be struck uh, aware that they are about to be hit by a missile by hitting them with a missile. Um, I mean, it shouldn't really be a joke, but <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of staggering. So I want you to pay attention to the warning strikes. Um, I'm going to show you them at least once, um, and then I'm going to show you them again as a four screen. I just want you to tell me if there's anything you notice that's unusual about them. That's one. That's two. These are the demolition strikes. So quite a sizable explosion. This, the building that was destroyed was slated to be um, Palestine's National Library. Um, it had been unfinished for a long time um, due to a shortage of building materials. Um, okay, so, so I don't know if anyone spotted anything that time. I'm gonna play them one more time and then I'll show you them as, as a four. That's one. Okay, anybody notice anything? Okay, when I show you them as a four screen, does anybody notice anything? One of them is shot on a different camera. Okay, um, so clearly one video has an entirely different feel to the rest, why? Uh, well, let me play them again, all together. Is that gonna come again? Yeah, there we are. Now, keen-eyed amongst you spotted that one of them was filmed from a different camera. The keener-eyed of you might have spotted that two of these strikes were in fact in the same part of the building, they were the same strike filmed from two different angles. So this generates an awful lot of questions, right, about this specific incident and also about why, um, why regimes that practice military violence against civilian populations would care to share video material about it. Because um, what we have here is a situation where we have four videos, but they're only actually showing three strikes, um, and two of those videos are of the same strike. Why? 
Well, our research uh, shows that there were, in fact, four strikes carried out that day, warning strikes, followed by the demolition strikes. Um, and the first of those strikes killed two Palestinian teenagers uh, who were sat um, somewhere quite near that crosshair just to the south. And they were killed by, a, a, not this strike, but a previous strike. Um, OK, so perhaps the IDF has removed this video because they wanted to cover their tracks. Um, but in that case, why give us this little grain of information at all? Why not just show the, show the three strikes? Um, why publish videos, these kind of Call of Duty style um, videos with these congratulatory tweets anyway? I mean, I think there's a whole other interesting dynamic about the mediatization of war there that perhaps we'll get into in the Q&A. Um, so obviously it's not a new prospect that states and militaries should uh, mislead and defraud their citizens, us, um, and great reporting throughout the years has obviously exposed that. But the use of video material in the pursuit of that deception lately has provided us with a fresh opportunity to challenge and to expose and to offer um, a kind of counter-truth, to, to take all of these little grains, these little uh, free clues that, um, that states and militaries give us, and to reassemble them into a counter-narrative. Um, and that notion of assembling um, is very important. Um, because it's active. Um, to assemble, you really have to do things with your hands. Um, and at Forensic Architecture, we think of truth not as a noun, but as a verb, um, as a process of verification, of a truth that, that comes into being um, and that is built uh, by assembling perspectives. It comes into being between these perspectives. It's an ongoing practice in which the development of facts um, and the development of evidence is socialized. Um, and that the stakeholders in those facts are, um, are various, and what, and and, um, and that, that, that this is the result of coalition, really. Um, and this is the process that we call open verification uh, or horizontal verification. Um, now, Laurie mentioned this idea of counter forensics and why we call ourselves a counter forensics agency. Um, so where forensics is uh, the practice um, of the state, uh, it's closed, it's inaccessible, it's cordoned off, it's vertical, um, it proceeds inex inexorably from uh, investigation of a crime to identification of a sub subject to, um, to prosecution and to sentence. Um, counter forensics is the opposite. Uh, horizontal verification, um, it, it, it opens up the production of the evidence and it occurs in the open. Um, its strength is in its transparency. Um, its strength is in integrating and working across different forms of knowledge, um, across different institutions and disciplines which may at times appear like they have nothing in common or that they speak in entirely different registers. Um, and horizontal verification is about unifying those um, for reasons of mutual protection, mutual security and mutual reinforcement. Um, and now the internet here has a chance at redemption. Um, open sources and uh, the interconnectedness of information um, is really at the heart of this process. Um, investigators, uh, as we've already seen, um, now have remote access to information um, about uh, human, rights uh, human rights violations all around the world. Um, images carried over great distances are now bringing specialists and investigators right into the heart of zones of conflict and right into the heart of debates about um, violations that occur there. Um, so I want to think a little bit about what this looks like in practice. I want to tell you uh, how we think that looks in practice, and I want to do so through the lens of a few of our cases, um, or at least moments in our cases. I'm, I'm going to have to skate along the surface um, to some extent. Um, OK, and I want to start in uh, the northern Negev desert. Um, this is um, the night of the 18th of January, 2017, in a village called Umar Khiran. Um, this is what a military police raid looks like on a Palestinian Bedouin village. Um, and uh, these raids are part of Israeli government policy um, that to uh, clear uh, existing long-standing Palestinian Bedouin villages uh, and to replace them with uh, settlements for Israeli citizens. Um, now, in the chaos of this night, 18th of January 2017, a local uh, teacher was shot dead um, and an Israeli policeman was run over. Um, the government claimed that the teacher accelerated towards the police with his headlights off and that he had to be shot through his car win uh, windscreen in self-defense. Um, but our friends and our allies uh, on the ground said that something wasn't right with this and um, so we, we felt we had to investigate. Um, so we're back to... Um, uh, arms of the Israeli state on Twitter. Um, 
We've got a Facebook logo there, but this did actually come through Twitter. Excuse me. Um, maybe it was both. Um, so they released the following video in which they claimed that uh, the victim was driving towards their police with um, his headlights off. So here we are. Here he is driving towards his headlights uh, with his headlights off. You'll see these four have just fired on him. Um, and now he's heading into this group of policemen. At that moment, um, one of those policemen is tragically uh, struck and killed. Um, and then you'll see the car coming to a stop. Um, so this is a, a second piece of aerial footage that was released. This is again uh, aerial thermal footage that was released by um, the Israeli police to um, support their argument. Um, and then we'll just pull it back to here. Okay, so um, the claim was that the victim had um, driven towards his, uh, the police with their lights off, intending to uh, cause them harm. Um, again, a little audience participation. What's wrong with that statement, given that it's based on this thermal imaging footage? You can't see headlights on thermal imaging footage because they wouldn't emit, emit substantially more heat energy um, than their surroundings. Um, so this was our first response. Um, still, however, um, the police said, well, um, you can see him accelerating towards um, the group of policemen. Why would he do that if he didn't have um, a sort of uh, a motive of aggression, as it were? Um, so we went back to our uh, activist allies on the ground. We found journalists from Al Jazeera who had been covering this uh, night raid, um, which was a sort of pre-announced uh, effort to demolish some houses in the village. Um, and Okay, so this is the footage that we found from Al Jazeera. Um, I'm just going to pull that back and show you that we synchronized this with um, footage from an activist on the ground from a group called Active Still. Those four shots. Are the shots uh, which killed the victim. Um, and... Uh, those were the shots that, uh, that allowed us to synchronize these two pieces of footage to show that um, we understood now that they were capturing the same incident and to align them uh, in time. Um, so they're both filmed at the same time and then we realized that they might have caught a potentially important detail. Could this car, we wondered, be the victim's car? And if so, his headlights were on. So. We know they're both filmed at the same time. We need to verify that these videos, um, which were a different perspective on the same event, um, had captured, in fact, the same sequence of events as the thermal footage. And if we could do that, um, then we had a way to push back on this claim about the headlights. Um, so we see one, two, uh, we're going to see three, four people silhouetted against this car. And then we move into our model, and we're able to move up to the perspective of the thermal footage, and what do you know? We see people in effectively the, 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 the same arrangement. Um, so we can begin to be fairly confident that this is, in fact, uh, the moment that these, um, that these videos on the ground captured, um, and we can once and for all put to bed the headlight story. Um, still, uh, I realize I jumped ahead a slide. Uh, still, the police said, um, they came at us with, uh, he came at us with his, uh, uh, sorry, he accelerated towards the policeman. Um, and why would he have done that if he didn't have some, um, some aggressive intent? Um, so what we did then is we, um, we moved from the model space, which we've already seen, into, um, back into the real world. Uh, we went uh, to the village um, of Omar Khiran in the northern Negev desert. Um, in the company of members of the victim's family then, um, and other members of the village, we reenacted um, the event as best we could. Um, this is them explaining um, where certain elements of, of the, the, the incident went down, and here we go, recreating the event. And now what you can see when we're at ground level is this slope, which is not evident in the thermal footage. Um, it's about now that this person directly in front of the car there is, about, is, is, is simulating shooting the driver. The driver takes his foot off the accelerator and the brake. Um, 
and a bit ahead of myself. There, you see the shots flashing. So, an incapacitated driver, a car driving down an incline, follows essentially the route that we see in the thermal footage. Um, so in this instance, the facts that could disprove lies by the Israeli state were actually written into the land itself. Um, you know, they were literally right there in front of our eyes and they were, we, were, we were standing on the evidence. Um, now I want to take you from here to, um, to Gaza, uh, yes, back to Gaza, um, to the eastern border fence of Gaza, um, where we went this year to investigate cases of aerial herbiciding um, on the eastern border. Now the Israeli army says that it has to clear land along the border fence um, for security purposes, but farmers told us that herbicides were being sprayed over their farmlands. Um, so we use this footage uh, of the planes um, spraying their aerial herbicides, we modeled their flight paths, uh, we geolocated them, um, and that essentially allowed us to uh, plot um, the roots of these, excuse me, of these um, herbicide sprayings on a map. So we compared the video metadata to publicly available weather data, and that showed us that Israeli planes would almost always carry out herbicide spraying when the winds were spraying uh, into Gaza. So what that meant was that uh, we could um, engage fluid dynamics experts from the University of London um, to look at um, what the uh, potential distribution of those chemicals would be from the heights that the plane was flying um, in the wind conditions that we had. Um, and so we did so, uh, and what that showed us is that um, toxic herbiciding chemicals were being carried um, up to uh, 300 or 400 meters into Gaza, um, destroying uh, vital agricultural land and obviously very limited agricultural land, um, the confines of Gaza being what they are. Um, we then went um, into Gaza. Um, we have field researchers there um, with extensive networks of contacts on the ground, and um, we confirmed that remote analysis by studying the plant matter itself. So once again, this investigation is an example of what's possible when testimony and video evidence um, and fluid dynamics uh, combine and mutually support one another to build a sort of um, minimum viable truth that each of these disciplines can sort of support and attest to. Um, and again, it shows that the evidence is there on the ground. Um, and it's open sources um, and our sort of mutual connectedness, properly coordinated, um, which amplifies that evidence and takes it beyond uh, the cordon, um, in this case, the physical cordon of the Gaza border fence, um, and out into the world. Um, okay, another example here, you, you will see members of the rescue, rescue NGO uh, Jugendrettet, uh, towing a migrant boat in the southern Mediterranean off Libya. Some of you might be aware um, of this NGO and, and this case. Um, so this footage that you're about to see caused the vessel, the Juventa, to be impounded and uh, on charges of uh, coordinating with uh, Libyan people smugglers. Um, so prosecutors in Italy say that this footage of the boat uh, being towed, uh, this is footage of, the, of a boat being towed back towards the Libyan coast where it would then be handed back to people smugglers um, to be used again in their smuggling operation. Um, so what you're seeing here is the process of us stabilizing that footage, um, motion tracking the waves um, to understand the direction of the wind that day. Um, you can see that essentially what's happening uh, is the waves are moving this way across the screen, um, sort of against the direction of the, of the dinghy. Um, and we matched that footage then um, to known wind directions uh, from publicly available weather data. And what that showed us, you probably guess where this is going, 
what that showed us is that the boat was in fact being pulled, being tugged northeast um, into the Mediterranean um, rather than back towards the Libyan coast. So again, um, it's a sort of throwaway uh, piece of evidentiary material, evidentiary image material um, that a, a state prosecutor might expect to be able to get away with. Um, but the material uh, needed to, um, to disprove that case is available to all of us. Admittedly, the techniques of motion tracking are somewhat uh, technically demanding. I can't do them. Um, but our architects and modelers can. Um, but uh, in principle, these techniques are available to anyone. Um, OK, now I want to take you to uh, Cameroon. Um, and this is something of a cautionary tale. Um, this is the military base of Salak. This will be familiar to uh, some people, I believe. Um, I want to show you a little bit about what was possible with uh, open source techniques as a kind of cautionary tale about uh, what technically is getting more difficult um, and how um, open source investigators um, and this community of researchers is really, um, in, in a sense, sort of, in, in, not enthralled to, but somewhat hogtied by uh, Silicon Valley and um, what, well, what Mark Zuckerberg decides, decides to do with his platform. Um, so this is Salak, uh, a military base in northern Cameroon. Um, it's used by the Cameroonian Special Forces. It's at the heart of um, Cameroon's fight against Boko Haram. Um, and we received testimony uh, and witness reports via Amnesty International that uh, torture, detention, and um, the killing of civilians was occurring here. Um, we also heard suggestions that uh, white people, um, that U.S. Uh, and European I'm not playing, excuse me, uh, that white people, that US and European soldiers or contractors uh, had been seen in this base. Um, and uh, these photos were posted to, um, uh, to Facebook by a, a US military contractor. Um, uh, yeah, public, um, public privacy settings, geotagged to this location. Uh, it doesn't often get this easy. Um, so combined with, uh, so, so what, this, what this allowed us to do was, um, you know, to map out exactly where, um, this is an interesting one, um, to map out exactly where um, US personnel had been in the base, where in theory they were allowed to go. Um, this, you know, it also gave us some additional uh, information. This is um, uh, a member of the US Special Forces training uh, Cameroonian recruits how to use night vision equipment. If you go on usaspending.gov, you will see contracts uh, for the sale of night vision equipment to Cameroon um, uh, about six months before this photo was taken. Um, and, um, oh, there's one more, isn't there? And here they are playing uh, night vision football, um, which when you think about it, is probably a very good way to train how to use night vision equipment. Um, but combined, uh, with the information that we had from Amnesty and combined with um, architectural details in those testimonies, um, what this meant was we were able to lay out this map um, of where US personnel uh, were able to go in the base, uh, where, people we, where, where people claimed to have been detained. Um, oh dear, oh nuts, sorry. Um, we'll just have to watch it again. And, um, and where they um, were, um, and where they were being tortured, that's right. Um, and um, you could see there from this map, which we're going to arrive at again in a few seconds, that uh, there was quite a lot of overlay. These, these troops seem to have quite a lot of freedom to move around the base um, at will. Um, and so what we were able to conclude was that torture was going on uh, in places which, at the very least, uh, was visible to and accessible to um, US personnel. Now, this led to um, an internal inquiry by the US um, Africa Command. It led to the cessation of military aid um, from the US to Cameroon, um, at least temporarily. And um, we believe it led to the release of some people from um, detention in that site. Um, but why did I want to show you this, this clip? Well, because, the, as I say, the case was actually unlocked by some quite straightforward um, sort of open source research techniques. Um, but in the two years since, those techniques no longer work. Um, this is something you might be familiar with. It's called graph searching. It was a, um, an incredibly powerful way of, um, of searching through Facebook, which has 
been almost entirely crippled now by changes to Facebook's um, sort of privacy um, settings. Um, uh, and this really is a reminder for us that uh, the possibilities of horizontal verification, the technical possibilities available to open source investigators are um, contingent. They're contingent, as I say, on the, on the um, moors of Silicon Valley and, um, uh, and indeed possibly someday on regulation if that ever comes around. Um, and that they exist in a kind of ever-evolving dance with these, um, with these restrictive um, elements. Um, so, for example, last year we saw the Russian parliament um, prohibited its soldiers from, prohibited Russian soldiers from using V-contact while they were on um, operations. Um, and, uh, of course, you might be familiar with the fact that that was, um, that was that practice which allowed Bellingcat to show um, so comprehensively that the Russian regular armed forces were in eastern Ukraine because they were literally taking photos of themselves there and geotagging it in their uniforms. Um, and we're also seeing now um, with um, uh, open source research on the, um, the war in Yemen that um, a lot of uh, valuable evidentiary material is being rapidly taken down by YouTube's algorithm at the same time as these really horrific distortions of children's cartoons remain up there. Um, so we're always um, fighting an uphill battle in that respect and we're always contingent on um, the possibilities afforded to us by these, uh, these tech companies. Um, okay, we are, uh, I, I'm, I seem to be running a little bit behind time, so I'm going to have to skip over telling you about our um, uh, foray into machine learning uh, and synthetic data. Um, sorry about that, but we might be able to come back to it. Um, but we are looking at building a tool which would allow um, uh, to, uh, to apply object detection image classifiers to, um, uh, to public domain video material, um, which hopefully will shortcut one of the really um, labor intensive parts of open source research, which is looking at hours upon hours upon hours of video material which doesn't have any evidence in it, looking for the couple of frames that do. If we can get a classifier to do that for us and to prioritize some of that information, then um, uh, we might be able to save everyone a whole lot of time. It's called M-Triage. Um, you can look out for it in the near future. Hopefully, it's going to be a game changer. Um, okay, I want to finish by talking about um, the case that we did uh, on the murder of Halit Yozgat um, uh, in Kassel, um, which uh, really, for us, um, in many ways, is a perfect example of the necessity and the strengths and weaknesses um, of uh, horizontal verification. Um, it began with... Um, I, I, I'm going to assume everyone has a sort of passing knowledge of the case of Halit Yozgat and the NSU. Um, in this case, the murder of Halit Yozgat and our investigation of it began with a quite remarkable piece of evidence. What you see on the iPad here is um, a video of um, the Fassungsschutz agent Andreas Temmer um, uh, acting out for local Hessen police how he left the internet cafe that he was in while Halit Yozgat was murdered on, the, on, on, on that day, very shortly after the murder had taken place, um, or as he says before. Um, which is remarkable because that, that means, I mean, this is, this is the crime itself right here. This is perjury on tape performed willingly for the police in their, in their presence. Um, so um, what you're seeing on, on screen here um, is us reenacting, as we did in Umar Khiran, reenacting um, what, we, what we had on tape, what was um, video material that was produced um, by the state, um, reenacting to kind of unpack it. And around that incredible, remarkable piece of evidence, we began to assemble all of these other ways of speaking to this case that we could, that we could think of. Um, so one of them was this reenactment, uh, which took place not far from here in the Hakave. Um, we opened up uh, this space that we'd created, this one-to-one -one physical reconstruction of the internet cafe. We held press conferences, we invited politicians um, and members of the police to come and see it. Um, and um, we, uh, we merged this information um, that we understood from this one-to-one -one reconstruction with, uh, for example, um, again, fluid dynamics, um, so we could overlay the movements of uh, Andreas Temer at the time that they um, took place uh, with um, exactly how um, the, uh, the smell of gunpowder from two gunshots would move through the room. Um, this we must remember, Andreas Temer has shotguns every single day of his life. He's very familiar with the smell of gunpowder, um, and there seems to be quite a lot of it in the room. Um, 
And it's also, it's also a really interesting example of horizontal verification for us because there was such a powerful afterlife to this project. There was such an interesting um, sequence of events that followed our, uh, the release. Um, we, we held a press conference in which we showed this to um, we showed this material to local politicians and to the media. We were invited um, to uh, submit this work to um, the, the trial of uh, Beata Schaper and the others. Um, unfortunately, because of a, a sort of technical error that was out of our hands, that um, submission was never able to take place and we were essentially um, blocked from, from um, entering into that space. Um, but this is you know, something that happens in counter forensics. You know, we, we don't have the privileged access to the state, uh, to, to, the, to the judiciary and to these, these legal spaces. Um, so we took our work to Documento. It was seen by half a million people. Um, we took it to the NSU tribunal in Köln, uh, where uh, our sort of technical specialism and the specialisms that we had arranged within our model um, stood alongside the, the very rich, situated knowledge of uh, the people who had um, who were close to the families of Halit Yoska and the other victims of the NSU um, and to those who'd experienced the deep structural racism that um, was at the heart of the NSU scandal. Um, and it culminated in this mural, um, which was first presented at the ICA uh, in London and exhibited half a dozen times around the world. Um, and uh, this sort of contextualizes our work into the, um, into the wider context of the NSU case. I'm going to try and explain it very, very briefly. So every one of these rows that you see here um, is a different forum, the legal, the political, the civil society, cultural, and the media. Um, now, at the top, you see this gray line is the forensic process. This is uh, the state's investigation um, of the crime proceeding um, inexorably through identification of suspects, anal sorry, analysis of the crime scene, investigation of suspects, um, through charges, through trial to prosecution to sentence. Um, and what you see below in, the, in these various shades of red is the counter forensic process. It's messy, it's tangled, and it has to move laterally through forums. It has to, uh, it has to deal with uh, obstructions, it has to hit dead ends and come back and see where we can move forward. Uh, through, other, um, through other means and through other coalitions. Um, because, of course, when the state is both defendant and juror, as it is in this case, um, so nearly done. Um, when the state is both defendant and juror, as it was in this case, then this is the kind of mess that becomes necessary uh, to try and unpick it and to try and access some kind of truth. Um, Okay, so, so horizontal ver verification requires creating these kind, kind of coalitions across disciplines. Um, these coalitions, they create trust. They also serve, as I said, to a means of, as a means of protection. And when that same truth uh, claim is made by multiple actors, uh, you know, there's no value necessarily in silencing one. That's what I mean by this protection. Um, there's something really lovely I learned about the word coalition. Coalition means um, to grow together, to mutually grow around something common. Um, that's where the, there's a Latin root in there that means this sort of mutual growth. And, and, and exactly what happens with horizontal verification, the essence of it is, um, is truth growing out of mutual trust. Um, now, what I want to talk to you about, Laurie, and all of you, um, is, is what this means about uh, what truth is, you know, because it makes truth something bounded and it makes truth something subjective with insiders and outsiders. Um, and to what extent is building truth and building trust the same thing? Um, we have this question now, how do, we re how do we reconnect this community of horizontal verification, this, um, of, of this truth production on a horizontal level? How do we, we, we reconnect that with something vertical, with something, with institutions of authority, with, um, with institutions that, can, um, that can, can give us justice, essentially? Um, also, you know, how do we restore a sense of universal facticity? How do we make truth something universal again? We always used to think it was. Um, and horizontal verification really has to admit defeat on that to begin to build forward again. Um, okay, um, I'm going to finish there and I look forward to discussing some of this with you. Yeah. So, when we were preparing this, um, Robert was very serious and theoretical, and I was like, but Robert, show them how damn cool it is what you do. I think he showed that, didn't he? I mean, it's pretty amazing, right? Um, 
So, Robert, what I wanted to talk to you about is what you just mentioned, you know, about how we start connecting this horizontal uh, truth production with more vertical um, institutions. So you did a lot of research into the Israel-Palestine conflict, and um, this is a conflict that I'm personally very interested in. But what I keep seeing is that time and time again, investigators prove that Israel is systematically you know, breaking international law and abusing human rights, and yet nothing ever really changes. That's how I personally, if you look at the situation. Um, and I mean, the subtitle of this conference is Independent Investigations for Change. And I see lots of investigations, but very little change. How, how do you view that? Um, yeah, well, that's the big question, isn't it? Um, I think there's a few different things to say in response. Um, I think, first of all, um, yeah, it is. It's. It can be really disheartening. It can be really frustrating um, that uh, changes wrought by our investigations. And you know, I mean, the work that you guys have done at Air Wars is incredible and really has actually landed some um, some big changes. And all these changes are big and small at the same time, aren't they? Really, that's what I was going to go on to say. Um, you know, I, I, th there's there's quite a few of these investigations. I haven't really told you what happened afterwards because. As you say, not, often not a lot happens, but um, in a sense, I think uh, we have to take a heart in what seem like quantitatively small victories, um, not only because they are victories at all, and, and um, uh, a better outcome for one life is, is better than a better outcome for no lives, um, but also I, I think you have to step back and think about the work of forensic architecture and Air Wars and Bellingcat and, and the, the, the power of the open source um, investigative community um, in uh, a systemic way and in a sort of qualitative way as well as a quantitative way. You know, we are, um, th there are, there are step changes happening even when the um, actual amount of um, sort of immediate value seems small. Um, you know, I mentioned Air Wars. Um, they, they work out of a tiny uh, terraced house in um, southeast London, just around the corner from where we work. Um, and last year they got the RAF finally to admit, so the RAF was, was carrying out bombing campaigns in uh, Syria and Iraq for three years against ISIS um, and revolutionized modern warfare because they didn't kill a single civilian by their own measure. Um, you think of the tens of thousands of pounds of bombs that were dropped and they didn't kill a civilian. Um, over, I mean, you saw what happened to Raqqa and they didn't kill any civilians. Um, and <laughs> the team of investigators, volunteers, part-time investigators, working out of learning as they went, working out of this little house in southeast London, got the RAF to admit that they killed one. One. But you think that's, that's only one, but the step from naught to one is much bigger than the step from one to two. Um, and that's, that brings me a lot of heart. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, we, we, we work a lot in Israel um, and um, we're, we're, we're going to go to court in Israel um, um, in the future, I'm sure. Um, and that will, be, um, that will be a big step for us, you know, to, to, um, to, be, a, to be accepted in legal forums. Um, you know, we, we have, um, we've had our work um, appraised by the ICC, for example, and, it's, it's, it, uh, and indeed in national courtrooms around the world, and, and, and we hope that there are more coming. Um, and so it, the changes are slow and they're small, but they are, they're, they're, there's like qualitative changes here. I mean, you look at what, Be what Bellingcat have managed to, um, how the ways they've managed to embarrass the Russian state um, in, in the last couple of years. You know, these are, these are big things, even when, you know, the, the pile of shit is so big still, but there's tiny little bits of it being cleared away. Um, and I, I think the final thing is it, um, uh, you know, in, in a sense, I feel like the, the scale of the problem is so big, but at least we know what we know. Where, we know what the excuse me. We know who the enemy is. We know what the enemy is. We know what fight we're engaged in. I certainly think this about um, this sort of dissolution of truth um, that we've um, encountered. At least, you know, maybe we maybe there was this end of history thing going on, and we all got very confident about the fact that truth was something that we, we were all very secure in what that meant. Um, 
and now we're not anymore, and now we have to start these difficult conversations of building it again. I was just thinking that no one actually introduced Air Wars. Um, so just for the people mm. who are like, I have no clue what this is about. So um, I'm a geolocator for Air Wars, and what we do is we, um, we document all the civilian casualties that fall in Syria and Iraq. Um, we started with the US-led coalition that was bombing in the fight against ISIS. Um, and now we're also tracking uh, Russia, and we're going to move to a few other countries. It's amazing work. Thank you. I'm very proud to be a part of it. Um, so I'm going to ask you a terrible question, and you're going to hate me for it. But can you give a definition of truth? You said you wouldn't ask that one. I'm sorry. Um, and now I've kind of used up all my lines in the previous answer. No, because you said you wanted to talk about truth. I, d I do. Well, I, I mean, I think this, it's... it's um, as I, as, I, as I ended the last question, I knew I should have held this one. Um, you know, it, we, we, all, we all felt like we knew what truth was. And I, and I, I think there's, um, you know, there are local reasons why uh, truth has kind of collapsed and our sort of shared assumptions about truth, what truth is has collapsed. I mean, you look at the Iraq war, at least in the UK, was a very, very good example of when we all lost faith in institutional truth. Um, that kind of finished off a process that a lot of ministerial scandals through the 80s and 90s had begun. Um, the US, I mean, where to start? From Nixon to Reagan to, uh, I did not have sex with that woman, to, um, you know, but these are serious things that, 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 that chip away at, the, at these institutions. And, and all of a sudden, um, the, then smartphones came along and all of a sudden everybody could uh, step around these institutions and say, oh, I'm going to look that one up myself. And, um, and, it's, and it's collapsed. The whole edifice has come down and I think it's really exciting to be engaged in the project of working out uh, what we should have been thinking about truth all along when we were thinking this thing that actually didn't work and that was quite vulnerable. Um, you just gave us a five minutes, didn't you, a minute ago, a minute or two ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because I think that's a really good question to ask all of you because it's really difficult. Right, well, I mean, I already think we had the intense discussion. So please keep your questions short and direct. That'd be fantastic. Um, anyone with a question? Emmanuel. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for the presentation. So I was wondering in in, uh, in terms of both the evidence that you're gathering and, and the way you, you produce that evidence, whether you think things are going to change, and specifically with uh, a more accessible, um, uh, you know, fake, like ways to make fake videos, basically. Uh, are you gonna, is this something that you're going to be able to... to is, is there going to be a point where you can't tell if, if a video is true or not? Uh, for example, if the Israeli defense forces get better at uh, um, faking stuff, uh, is there going to be a point where actually that kind of evidence is, is no longer uh, usable? And, and then the other uh, aspect of that, um, you know, you mentioned Bellingcat and, and this whole community of, um, of horizontal research or open source research um, has moved from like, a, a, you know, pretty unknown group of, of people digging into, into videos and mostly talking amongst themselves to like a very high, uh, high profile group of people. And the kind of uh, uh, visual grammar that you're using and, and the very kind of technical uh, looks of the videos is, is uh, I think, helping quite a bit in, in asserting their uh, validity. And I was wondering if you're uh, worried maybe that at some point that, that way of presenting data, like, uh, you know, um, the different color circles around people's faces or around different things, is that going to be co-opted to, to prove fake news, basically? That's a really good question. Um, okay, so, so to the first one, I, um, I, I don't know, I, I, do want, I do think that maybe we're more worried about deep fakes than we should be. Um, I, That's controversial, you're going to have to explain that You now. think so? Um, okay, I mean, there, there's already an issue with people um, being misled by what they see in videos, right? We already have that video literacy problem, uh, for one. Um, you don't actually need deep fakes to, to make people believe um, things that aren't true with videos. So we're already fighting that battle. Um, 
I'm not a technical guy, uh, but um, I have faith in people that are, that um, it's not going to be possible to um, fake videos in ways that aren't ultimately traceable. And we, we, we always saw the that that was the case with images. Um, nobody's ever created a synthetic image that um, has held up to total scrutiny. Um, there's a guy doing some great facial expressions over there, so I think we might have to go to him afterwards. Um, uh, there's also, I mean, there's also something um, in the content of deep fakes, right? And there's, there's something which, um, okay, that's, there's, there's other things I could have said about truth. Um, for us, truth is about, um, our director uses this word, polyperspectivity. Um, truth is something that sits between perspectives, right? And those can be perspectives of cameras, uh, or they can be perspectives of disciplines, perspectives of uh, situated knowledge. Um, and the, the, the power of our investigations to turn that kind of polyperspectivity into, um, into truth, uh, in, you know, into like a very convincing argument ever, uh, and anyway, and, and uh, into evidence that has been accepted in courtrooms around the world, um, gives me a lot of faith that um, perspectives are what beat deep fakes. Right? Deep fakes are only effective when you only have one video of one thing happening. And we are always very suspicious when you have one video of one thing happening anyway. That's just a good place to be. You're always a lot safer when you have two, because two things reinforce, and the two together are stronger than the sum of their parts. Um, okay, to the um, question of uh, Bellingcat and others hitting the big time and this, these techniques going global, there was something um, which made us laugh. Uh, maybe it was at the tail end of last year now, um, when, I mean, obviously, you, you know, you're familiar with RT and Bellingcat, little back and forth, it's been going on for years, and it's kind of funny and kind of childish. Um, and RT have got into open source investigations now. They opened an open source investigation division. How silly is that? Um, so, you know, and, and what are they going to do with it? Of course, they're going to try and muddy these waters. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we're right to be, um, we're right to be cautious. I think there is, um, like you say, the red and yellow boxes around things in images. It's like, it's, um, it's a whole new visual language. And, and like any language, it can be spoken well and it can be spoken badly. Um, and I think that's uh, it's definitely something we've got to watch out for. We can't just assume that every time there's a red box around a building and a red box on a satellite image, those two are the same thing. Um, and you know you do see bad examples of it. Um, you don't see it, you don't often see it from Bellingcat because they're they're very very good at that work. But you know you you see it from your freelance guys on the internet on Twitter um, here and there. Or you know it's not like they're necessarily wrong, but it's not necessarily explained that well. But I don't think that's a problem that's unique to this form. That's that's just a problem of storytelling, right? Um, yeah. Any next questions? question. Um, so you mentioned there was a technical error and the, the murder of Halid that uh, made the, the yeah. evidence inadmissible. So could you maybe give us more information about that? Uh, I can. It's, it's not suspicious at all, and I don't want to... Um, a, a lawyer we were working with made a, made a bureaucratic mistake, essentially. We saw some information earlier than we, the, before we were cleared to see it, um, and that would have made our position untenable in the courtroom. It's a really unfortunate circumstance, and that lawyer was otherwise phenomenal in all of the work that they did with us. So I, I, I don't want to say any more than that, really. Hi, I'm Lisa. Thank you for your presentation. Hi. Um, I work for a cultural institution. Actually, it's Hakavi, where he also filmed or reenacted Ali Yozgat's uh, murder. Cool. Um, and I wonder, because you've been present in cultural spaces much more than in legal or juridical spaces, as you've indicated before, and cultural spaces are quite safe spaces. Um, there is more space for dissonance and for opinion. Um, and I wonder if, I know that cultural institutions also use organizations like forensic architecture to, um, to politicize themselves, to obtain more funds from governments. Um, and I wonder if by, um, if, they, if cultural spaces could not swallow up the, the evidential power that you actually present, and if they don't, if you act, if they don't risk depoliticizing your work. And while I agree that the more people they see it, the better, I just wonder if it's a, you know, it's a very um, comfortable ex excuse to transfer the debate into the safe spaces of cultural spaces. 
Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, I think um, a little bit, of it maybe a little bit hard on us, We're, but we certainly think about, we, th we you know, th these thoughts are going through our head, um, absolutely. Um, you know, sometimes it's it's the only resort we have, right? I mean, of course, it's you know, it's it's to say it's a safe space is also to say it's an available space, right? Um, uh, but but I, I don't mean uh, I'm not getting defensive about that question because you're totally right, and these are things that we think about a lot, and um, we um, you know we 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 kind of we, we relish this position that we have between the sort of arts and cultural domain and the domains of human rights and investigation and um, technology and um, and we enjoy bringing one into the other, right? And we find it very productive. Um, we are certainly aware that there are um, the things we need to be careful about it, and we've, we've been shown that. Um, we've had that demonstrated to us um, previously. Um, so we re recently um, exhibited, well, it's still going on, at the uh, Whitney Biennial um, in New York. Um, and uh, this is a good, a good case to talk about in relation to this, because um, what happened there was we entered into um, a, a controversy that was already uh, that, that was already going on. Um, one of the board members, a vice chair of the board there, owned a tear gas manufacturer and he also profited from a, a company um, that makes sniper bullets that were used um, by the Israeli snipers across the Gaza border. Um, and um, so we uh, we agreed to partake in that, uh, to, to sort of exhibit new work in that biennial um, on the condition, and this was never resisted, the curators were great, on, on the condition that we would um, make a work that addressed that controversy and that was directed towards um, this individual and his relationship with the Whitney and his, and his companies. Um, so that for us felt like a really useful way of um, engaging with that question of, kind of toxic philanthropy, uh, which is, you know, it's a great moment to talk about that again. Um, but, but that goes to what you're saying, right? We, uh, may, maybe we get swallowed up by it a little. Um, you know, something that we've thought for a long time, so the, 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 the kind of the trade-off that we've understood that we have to make is that, um, I mean, I hesitate to say this on camera, but sh show me a, uh, an arts and cultural institution that doesn't have some problematic money on its board. Um, you know, what's, what money is, is good money in the end? Um, I've said it now. Um, and, um, so, so we've always thought, well, we, we take that trade-off because we take cases like um, the case of Harit Yoska, the case in Omar Khiran, the case of um, uh, Yaqub Abu al -Kian, um, and those are cases that wouldn't get that exposure anywhere else, and maybe we can do something with that, and we swallow the fact that maybe we are burnishing the reputations of these institutions and um, that, that, that maybe have something problematic lying behind them anyway. And, um, you know, I think even as I say that, it feels like I'm rather over-egging our... Um, you know, what we bring to an institution necessarily. Um, and now I'm going to trail off there, sorry. In the back over there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Gabby. Hi. Hi. Um, one of the things I spend time thinking about in terms of horizontal verification, to use your words, is around. Um, the kind of risks of vicarious trauma that comes with looking at graphic content uh, and violent imagery. And the idea of um, democratizing or open source investigation brings with it the idea that people will look at, actually the content they're looking at is not really a satellite image. It's normally someone um, having something violent done to them. And I'm wondering what resiliency plans you have in place. And I know that Air Wars already has some resiliency plans in place. Um, do you think these are enough? And also how are you uh, working with people that you're encouraging to view this content and the resiliency plans around that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much for that question. Um, when I said in my introduction that there is a lot of questions we still need to answer about the field, for me, this is a very important one. Um, I personally have dealt with secondary trauma issues from looking at footage, and I found that very hard to um, to tell to people because I'm, you know, there are not that many women in this field, so you don't want to be the overly emotional women, like woman who's, you know, who can't handle her job. Um, and I found that starting that conversation was, it's pretty sensitive. Um, 
So I definitely don't think we're there yet in terms of policies and trauma preventing policies, um, and that it is still something that we as a community need to work on really hard. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are there are practical things that you can do to reduce the risk of vicarious trauma, and there are um, really great support institutions um, that show you what those things are. The Dart Center um, is is a really good example of that. Um, yeah, it, you know, there's um, there's something about the trauma um, that it's possible to feel vicariously through dealing with that material, though, which um, we should, I believe, um, inappropriately structured ways um, respond to creatively and uh, take in um, and hold and release in ways which are creative to our, or supportive to our sort of creative and investigative work. You know, we do this work because, uh, we, because we, we want to make a difference in those cases. Um, so I think there has to be a way that that trauma and sharing in that trauma in limited ways and can, can and should be productive for our practice. And I know that's not exactly what you were getting at because you were talking about you know, maybe people just doing this in their bedroom on their own, or um, you know, as more and more people, you know, it's like the explosion of a technique without the explosion of the ways to manage the potential harm of that technique. Um, I don't think that's um, exclusive in principle to open source research, but yeah, there is an awful lot of, um, of, of traumatic imagery out there. And, um, you know, you're right, maybe this is, maybe it's something that, c that the community needs to think about not doing only for the institutions ourselves that do this work, but making sure that that's something that's very clearly signposted. That's, there seems nothing wrong with that suggestion. Uh, thank you for the amazing presentation. And I'm gonna ask a very boring German privacy question. Uh, okay. You mentioned Facebook graph search and obviously open source intelligence is based often on you know, classic geotagged Facebook posts, stuff like that. Where do you think that after the big privacy backlash or the still ongoing privacy backlash against the big platforms, against Facebook, Twitter, uh, YouTube, etc., do you think that will hinder open source investigations in total? And where do you think open source investigations stand in the classic dilemma of you know, journalistic uh, public interest against the private sphere of those actually involved? It's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the way that you couched it towards the end there, um, you, you know, points out that this isn't a new dilemma. Uh, this isn't a new tension. Uh, journalism has always been about, um, to some extent, exploiting weaknesses in the privacy of others to find information. Um, yeah, I... I feel like it's only going to get harder. I feel like there is a sense in which the, like, the, the, the heyday of certainly, let's talk about Facebook, the heyday of searching for people on Facebook um, is maybe behind us. That's, that's, it's gotten harder. Um, uh, not only technically, but, but its, it's use isn't growing everywhere. Um, see, Central and West Africa, its use is still growing, and it seems to be a really productive tool to use there. Um, but in, the, in, other, in other places, it's not. Um, Sometimes I think about like what like um, what like a benevolent state-backed YouTube would look like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, because that's what we need. Um, we need somewhere that people can, you know. I mean, it's, it's amazing that that. Um, and as I said, that you know, investigators and specialists are being brought into the heart. Technical expertise, which couldn't otherwise get there, is being brought into the heart of uh, conflict like say like Yemen, somewhere where um, visibility is so hard, accessibility is so hard, and there's a, a real, you know, there's, a, there's an absolute horror story going on there and we can't, we can't get much information about it um, and the truth of it can't, can't easily come out. Um, and the only way that people are getting information out of it is by sending it via Silicon Valley and it's got this little bottleneck around human rights and it has to come all the way around there and then come back to us. Um, before we can do anything about it, before we can contribute in any minimal way. Um, so yeah, I've, I mean, it's, it's a shame that we're being that we're we're um, we're we're 
sort of throttled by um, by uh, inefficiency and the ineffectiveness of, of of corporations and by a set of priorities which are completely different. I agree. Five minutes. Oh, we still have five minutes. Oh, I thought we were done. That's fantastic. Does anyone else have a question? Two questions. Should we take them Guys? at the same time and then? No, okay, no. bad idea. Anyone? Oh, right there, there's a very shy hand going up. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask about, sort of, with the poly perspectivity of your investigations, like when you are a presenter of a case and you're starting to look, I'm curious how do you sort of prioritize the methods of engagement? Do you have sort of methods you've been developing? Is this documented, like how, I mean, I'm sure it's different every time, but I wonder if there's like a sort of routine, or like, you know, like a rule, set of rules or just methods of approach that you've been documenting to knowing which mediums to utilize. It really depends on the case, mm. honestly. Um, you know, I mentioned the Whitney. Uh, what we did there was um, eventually we, we so, so the work we exhibited there was was describing um, the early stages of our testing a synthetic image trained uh, machine learning object detection classifier. Um, still with me, which is uh, which is this tool that I, I showed briefly. Um, and we kind of told the story of how you train a classifier like that. Um, and we did that because this case came to us and it was, um, this controversy was about tear gas grenades and we were already um, sort of deep into a research direction around object detection and we thought, a tear, a tear gas grenade, that's an, that's an object that's, you know, that's recognizable that also has a quite a consistent um, sort of genre of um, documentation. You know, on Twitter you see a lot of people holding, holding a, a tear gas canister to the, um, to the camera with their fingers around it, logo pointing forward. So we thought, okay, maybe that's quite an interesting object to, to use in this case. So there, um, it was a case of kind of veering a research direction towards something that came to us. Um, you know, other times it might be that there's um, uh, just a certain amount of video material that we already have. Um, so um, we just published a case uh, into the killing of a, um, a man uh, called Harith Augustus in Chicago last year. Um, where the material that we had there was uh, body cam footage of the police that were involved in this killing. Um, and, you know, so, so, so in that case, the, the, the tenor of the, the register of the investigation, the way that, that investigation plays out, is very much to do with um, the video, is led by that video material. It's different every time. Okay, one more question. Go on, one more. Yeah. <laughs> Someone else that's not. Okay. Go the, ahead. The, um, uh, one question I had is the, 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 the kind of um, broader potential bias. There is, I, w I wanted to get your views on the potential bias there is in using uh, smartphone footage. Because, for example, the, um, what happened in Salak in, the, in northern Cameroon, this was pretty much the only kind of visual evidence of. of uh, uh, well, and then the videos the BBC did as well um, of, of the human rights violation by the army there, but there's very little footage and so basically nobody really cares about what happens in the, in the north of Cameroon, whereas in the, in the southwest where there's a conflict at the moment, um, it's, it's very prominent because of all, the, um, of all the footage that comes from that. So that's, I, I was wondering if you're thinking, how are you thinking about this, this kind of... Um, Bias. You mean kind of being drawn to where the evidence is? Well, yeah. Where the, mat where yeah. the material is, anyway? The, yeah, and, that, and then another aspect of that is also given there's uh, like a, a, a huge amount of funding that goes into making those videos, and then uh, less and less funding going to people actually going to those places and documenting the stuff themselves, like, like I, I do, maybe. <laughs> I actually I want to, to react to this. Because. In Holland, we right now have a discussion where as the um, Dutch government wants to have journalists ask permission before they can go into territory where terrorist organizations are operating. 
yes, it's very problematic. Um, we just sent a letter to our first chamber with a couple of, well, hundreds of journalists, actually. Um, and I think that's something I just want to put out there, is that while we have so much more um, opportunities in terms of, you know, in terms of open data, I personally find that actually going to these places and collecting the evidence is getting harder and harder. Um, not just by governments, but also by the current, you know, constructions we have of freelancers, where you're not backed by any big organizations. So I think that's just something, like people always go like, oh my God, like we know so much more today than we knew 20 years ago, and in a way we do, but we also should be aware of that it's not really going that great with our foreign reporting, in mm. my opinion. Yeah, I think, um there, you know, there is a sense in which, uh, I mean, this isn't unique to us, right? But the, when, when the evidence, when the material is there to, to investigate and to, 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 to get stuck into, then that's, that tends to be where the attention goes, right? It's like water taking a shortest path down a beach. Um, you know, that said, we have done investigations based on no video material. Um, um, the investigation we did into the Sednaya prism was, was, was built entirely without video material. Um, I think, you know, to your question of, of um, people being on the ground now, I mean, I know that this isn't what you meant by it, but, you know, it, it's a criticism that we receive often that we are remote from um, the sites that we're analyzing. I think that's, some, that's a, a criticism that's leveled in various ways at open source investigation in general, um, that it can be remote. Um, our, our response to, well, it's not a response to that, but our, how we work in relation to that is that we feel like um, it's, you know, we, in any case, we want to do what we do well and we want to let other people who do what they do well do that well, right? So we will work with uh, journalists there, you know, we'll in, in, in Gaza um, or uh, elsewhere in the Middle East or in, you know, in Greece, um, or we, we will work with, uh, indeed in America, we'll, we'll work with journalists who are on the ground there already. There's, you know, it's expensive uh, uh, to send me there and I don't have any contacts. Um, so we stay at our end and do the things that we feel like we can do that other people can't, and we let other people do those things. Um, I hope we're not taking funding from <laughs> people who are, um, who are there. Um, you know, our funding comes from fairly different places, I imagine. I'm gonna stop you, because okay. we're out of time. Thank you That's so much, Robert. a bit lame Robert. to end up talking about my funding, isn't it? So, thank you. Thank you very much. It was really interesting. I really want to, I want to thank you for this uh, grand finale <laughs> of our conference, uh, both of you. And uh, now we are going just to take five minutes to announce what is coming after in the next month. So thank you very much. And I will call you here with Milik. <laughs> So first of all, we want to remember the people that uh, will be at the workshop tomorrow, that we will meet at 12 uh, at Temple Oferfeld. So we will be with Emanuel Freudenthal for our flying in Berlin sky and afternoon investigation. And then uh, together with him and Sector Zero Certified, we will go uh, to analyze the data uh, that we acquire tracking planes with the antennas uh, at supermarkets. Uh, so we will have a, a fun afternoon of uh, open source investigation together. And then there will be some follow up. Yes, so following on this conference on the 2nd of October, which is a Wednesday, we are doing our next community meetup. So we run an uh, activation community program around our main conferences. And the next meetup will be on the 2nd of October, and it's taking place at State Studio in Schöneberg. And we invited uh, an organization from Berlin that's also working in the same field a bit as forensic architecture. So they're called the Syrian Archive and they work on collecting and preserving visual documentation of human rights violations uh, in Syria. 
and we invited them to give a workshop um, especially focused on the geolocation techniques they used for verifying images but they will also talk us through the whole workflow that they use for collecting data and uh, making sure it's preserved and then verified and also um, they're using open source tools so we invited Hadi Al Khatib who will be with us um, and there's still f a lot of spots free so we have a limited amount of uh, number of people that can join since it's a workshop but it's free to attend, so you just need to sign up to our website and then you can also join us. So it would be great to also see you there. And yeah, then another thing that's coming, but a bit further down the line, is the sort of grand finale of our whole year program and of the activation community program. So this is the activation community gathering. We'll be doing it here in Studio One on the 30th of November. And in this uh, final event of the disruption year, we will look back at the whole year program, so the art of in exposing injustice, and the three topics that we discussed throughout the year, and we will connect them with the community program. So we will also hear from Berlin-based initiatives and activists and communities that are working on these, these uh, fields. And we want to create a yeah, different type of event that's also interactive, so we will have workshops and uh, talks and a lot of different things where you can meet yeah, people working on these topics from Berlin and also some from abroad. So. Yeah, so we, we hope also to see you there. Format. We will disrupt the format a bit, but yeah, you will see. So yeah. please come to Studio One and we will let you know more, of course, about the program, what's happening also to our website. Or if you're not on the newsletter yet, please sign up. There's a paper there at the cash desk. So then you make sure to get all the information. And then we want to finally thank all the people that work with us for make this conference possible. So I want uh, first to thank our core team, Nada Bakker, Monty Harmony, Jonas Franchi, Giacomo Marin Salta, and also thanks to Lauren De Carli and Kim Sanu. Uh, so thanks a lot to them. Then we want to thank our video crew, uh, Gonzalo, Gabriel, Gabriel, and Hangel. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and the streaming uh, from the Boiling Head Media that have been on streaming all these days. Elena Veronese for the photography, Paolo Combes, Fran Francesco Mancori, and Thorsten Utken from the technology support. <laughs> and finally, Giorgio that was at the cash desk and all the helpers that have been helping us building up this place. So thank you. <laughs> and of course, a final thanks go to our great speakers that have been with us all these days. Yeah. And to Lieke. And to you. <laughs> so thank you, and so we will meet again tomorrow and uh, at the community event so and in November. November. Thanks a lot. <laughs>